Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Welcome back to our series on the book of Exodus. Got some really good information for you today. Again, we are in the teacher voice. So we're doing a little bit deeper dive into scripture. Throughout the year, we follow the voices called the um, APES ministry, apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. Shepherd can also be called the pastor. And why we do this is because each one of you in this room has one of these five gifts. Uh, the way that you learn, the way that you listen, the way that you apply God's word to your life is one of those five categories. And so we've had people come up and say, man, this is the best series that you've ever preached. And it's really not. It's just that it speaks to you differently because you might be more of a student and you like to learn from the teacher's voice. I'm having a hard time actually staying just in the teacher's voice. I keep bouncing back and forth between teacher and prophet, uh, which a lot of people enjoy the prophet voice. Uh, worshipers, writers, and that sort of stuff really enjoy that side of it as well. So I'm going to try to stay with my notes today, but I do have some good nuggets for you as we're studying the book of Exodus. It was written by Moses, believed to be written by Moses. It's included in the Torah, also known as the five books of Moses, Genesis to Deuteronomy, all right? So Exodus is this narrative story about uh, the rise of Moses and him leading the children of Israel, God's people, out of bondage, out of slavery, into the promised land, or to the cusp of promised land that Joshua leads them into. It's the redemption story of God's people. This word exodus that we use is actually a Latin term, the word exodus, but it comes from a Greek word, exodos, and it's a military term. It talks about a military expedition, or uh, a going out, a going out of battle or into battle. In the general sense, it means departing from a place. And you can see the Greek word here, which I don't really read uh, that well, but it means a way out or a way to depart. And I'm saying that God makes exodus moments in your life. Many of us have made some stupid decisions. And even in our stupid decisions where we did not bring God into the equation in making that decision, he can make an exodus moment to depart out of a bad season of your life, all right? You gotta believe it. We see in last week's sermon that uh, Moses did lead them out and that there's the parting of the Red Sea and they step into the wilderness and today we're gonna kind of dive a little bit deeper into some of that information and look at where they go. They come out of slavery, they come out of bondage, they cross the Red Sea and then they end up in the desert. You know what's funny is that a lot of us get stuck in, in deserts, spiritually. Spiritually speaking, and, and I'm not talking about it being a bad place, because a desert could be a great place to visit. Many of us want to go to Arizona and visit, and go to the Grand Canyon and visit, but no one wants to get stuck in a desert for 40 years, okay? We're going to take a look at this. The message of Christianity doesn't stop with being set free from your past. Get that. The message of Christianity does not stop with simply getting set free from your past. That's a great place. Freedom is a great place. But we don't want to just get stuck in freedom. We want to step into a promised land. We want to step into prosperity. I'm not just talking financially. I'm talking about emotions too. Right? You can get set free from depression but until you step into joy, you could be in a desert place. We should not be so concerned with the fact that we've escaped a bad past or bad moments that we settle for a wilderness. We got to know that God has a promised land for every single one of us. God has a promised life for every single one of us. And many of us settle for a bootleg version of a life that God designed. Anybody ever bought a bootleg DVD? It looks good, the cover looks right, but when you pop it in, 
and begin to actually watch that. Well, no one even watches DVDs anymore, I don't think. But you pop that DVD in, and immediately you realize that it's some guy with a camcorder on the third row. The audio's bad. It's all jittery. You hear people coughing. And some of us, we settle for that. Well, it looks a lot like the promised life. It looks a lot like the real thing. But it's not. It's a bootleg, and we settle for it. Today, we're going to add a new character into this Netflix series. And, and just like those series, like, they add a character in, and it takes a few episodes for this person to become, like, a starring role. And so today, we're going to enter a new character into the story of Exodus. His name is Joshua. Anybody ever heard of Joshua? I mean, maybe he's most known for Joshua and the walls of Jericho. Heard that story in the Bible? Yes, no? Okay. So let's take a look at this. In Exodus 17, verse 1, and there's, there's a couple words in here that I want to point out that are really important. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin. It's actually, you would say Sin, but we'll just say Sin today. Out of the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord did what? Commanded. So the Lord is leading them. But here's the important part in what I want to show you today. The whole Israelite community set out from the place. They're leaving, they're leaving the desert of sin. They're moving forward from a desert of sin. And I just want to throw this out there to you today, that there may be seasons in your life where there have been sins that were okay for you. Behaviors, thought processes, the way you viewed yourself, that were okay in that season for you. But God might want to lead you out of that place of sin into a new land, a new place of freedom from that. And again, what I'm throwing out, I'm not talking about one of the top 10 bad sins, because we all rate them, right? We rate sin on a certain level of, oh, those are really, that's an egregious sin, but I just told my boss I was sick and I really wasn't. That's just a little sin, that's not that big. I'm saying there might be habits in your life. There may be hangups in your life. There may be some hurts that you've played with and you've messed around with and God's saying, hey, I wanna move you out of that place. I wanna take you to a new land that has greater freedom, that has greater joy. Now watch this. So he's bringing them out of this place and that word sin is not what I just talked about sin. It, it, Olivia was the name of the desert but I'm just playing off the word, okay? You got me? They take them out of this place, this desert, and watch this, in verse eight. The, Amalekite, I mean, the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. So they're leaving this place, going to a new place, and immediately they're attacked. Isn't that just like the enemy? When you're ready to overcome an issue of your life, you're immediately attacked. When you're making a decision, I'm not going to do this anymore. This, this uh, season of my life is over. I'm moving on. Bam, the enemy comes and attacks. One, the enemy is the voice of the accuser. Well, who do you think you are that you could actually overcome that and move on? Right? And then you step forward. Okay, I'm not going to do that anymore. And then all of a sudden, the same thing that you've been tempted with and you've struggled with is just put in your face. Hey, want to come to my birthday party? Yeah, everyone's going to be drunk, but just come to my birthday party. You're like, I, I'm not drinking anymore. I'm hanging that up. I'm not doing that. What? It's my party. What, you're not going to come to my birthday party? Right, that can be an attack, putting a temptation that you're trying to overcome right back in your face. The Amalekites were attacked where? Rephidim. Rephidim. The name Rephidim is a Hebrew word that means a place of rest. So they're coming out of a place of sin and they're trying to get to a place of rest and they're attacked in the middle. They're trying to leave their past, step into a land that God has provided for them to rest and there's an attack. All right, let me ask you this. Maybe you can apply this to your life. Isn't it crazy that some of the most stressful moments are the days before you go on vacation? 
or you're packing up to get into the car and now you're in a fight with your spouse because they're late. And you're in the car honking the horn, honk, honk, we're gonna hit rush hour. We're supposed to be going to a place of rest. This is gonna be the best vacation, just get in the car. It feels like to me like when I go on my, my pastor retreats to get with other pastors to be refreshed and refueled, that like the week before I go on that trip, all these things come up that I say, man, I don't even, I can't really go on this trip. This is like the worst timing for me to go on this trip. I'm so stressed out right now. And it's like this attack right before rest. An attack right before rest. And I believe that God is speaking to some of you right now. Some of you might even be in a spiritual battle or a spiritual war. And, and, and God is saying this, even in the midst of spiritual warfare, I can lead you to rest. I wonder if today maybe someone has had a diagnosis or someone's going through a divorce or someone's going through a major life crisis. Maybe your kid is going away to college and your soul is hurting. And God is saying, even in the midst of that, you can find rest. Rest. Because the Bible says that he's the one leading you through the battle. He's leading you through it, right? He's not the author of the battle. He's not creating the, the battle's coming. The battle's trying to stop you. But God is speaking and leading you through to get to that place of rest. Now watch this in verse 9, Exodus 17, 9. And Moses says to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. With the staff of God in my hand. We're going to circle back to that, but just remember that. He says, I will stand on the hill and I will hold the staff of God in my hand. There's two things that we want to remember as we're studying this Bible out. The first thing is this. I mean, this scripture out. The first thing is this. This is the first time that we're seeing the name Joshua in scripture. He's now introduced as kind of like Moses' right-hand guy. Here he is. We're going we're to move through. We're gonna, I'm, I'm teaching him. I'm mentoring him. I'm showing him these things. And, and I want to show you this. The name Joshua actually comes from two words. Yeho, meaning God, and Shua, meaning salvation. Yehoshua, Joshua, right? Yehoshua, Joshua. So his name literally means God, God is salvation, right? So if you ever name someone Joshua, my right-hand guy is Joshua. I don't know that he is God is salvation, but his name means God is salvation, What's, <laughs> what's interesting about this name is that it's the first time in Scripture that we see the name Jesus. Now, what do you mean, Pastor Mark? What are you talking about? You just said his name's Joshua. How are you saying it's Jesus? Well, we say the name Jesus because the New Testament was written in Greek. And in Greek, his name is Joshua. But in Hebrew... And in Aramaic, his name is Yeshua. Yeshua is Joshua. And so I know people get hung up on this. And there's this huge debate online right now where the Bible is inaccurate because it says Jesus. His name wasn't Jesus. And if you don't say Yeshua, then you're not saying the right name. And people get stuck on this. But can we just use some common sense? If I went to Puerto Rico, my name is Miguel. See, comprende? In Espanol, mi nombre es Miguel. Does that mean that my name's not Michael? And if they translated my bibliography or my biography into Spanish and they said Miguel was here, no, this is inaccurate because Miguel wasn't here, Michael was here. Come on, somebody. We, 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 we. To, to think that scripture is inaccurate because we don't understand the text and the context is wild to me, right? So no, 
Jesus is the Greek translation of the name Joshua or the Greek name, Yesh, uh, the Hebrew name Yeshua or Aramaic name, okay? And so this is the introduction of Joshua in description. What I love about this is that Joshua comes on the scene with the same name as Jesus, which indicates to us, if we study scripture correctly, that Yeshua, Joshua, is a type and shadow, a type and shadow in scripture of the Jesus to come. It's a foreshadowing of a savior, of God is salvation who is going to come. And that's how Joshua enters into the scene. All throughout the Old Testament of the Bible, God leaves us these little clues in improper theology. And if you're going to get into the studying of the hermeneutics and the exegesis of Scripture, we can see that there's these types and shadows, things that happen in the Old Testament that gives us clues to what's happening in the New Testament. And that's what's happening here. God sends a deliverer. God sends a deliverer. The New Testament, we see that God does send the deliverer, Yeshua, Jesus, to deliver his people from sin, okay? And then also what I wanna point out in this passage is that Moses indicates that he's now holding something new in his hand. He's holding something new. When he parted the Red Sea, what was he holding in his hand? A staff. Now he says, I'll stand up on top of the hill and I will hold what? Oh, wait, so it's the same staff? Oh, my, wait, is my notes wrong? No, it's not. It might be the same staff, but it's a different person. It might be the same piece of wood, but it now has a different purpose. It may be the same staff that Jethro gave him to tend his flocks, but it now has a new confidence. See, God can use some of the things from your past to bring about deliverance for yourself and others. The thing that held you back in your past might be the tool that helps deliver and win battles for other people. Yeah. Scripture tells us, Scripture tells us, do not look at your brother for the speck that is in his eye. Right? I mean, preachers love doing this one. But instead, remove the plank from your eye. Right? For what purpose? Because the scripture keeps going. A lot of us stop there. So that you can help. Remove the plank from your eye so that you can help your brother remove the speck from his eye. Mm. Same tool, same problem, same sin, different purpose. We started off this series looking at a scared, stuttering Moses. What, what do I do if they don't believe me? What do I do? What do I say? How do I lead them? This is a different Moses in this scripture, right? In verse four, I mean, chapter four, verse one, what, what do I do if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to what I say? What if they say, the Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? And he's like, my shepherd's staff right? My pastoral leadership, my shepherd's staff, my ability to lead sheep. He goes, okay, just like I'm going to do in the New Testament when Peter's called and he says, well, I'm just a fisherman. And Jesus said, yeah, but today I will make you a fisher of men. I just have a staff that leads sheep. He says, ah, but today I'm leading you with a staff to lead people, to lead a generation, to lead an army. Now in, verse, in chapter 17, verse 9, watch. Moses said to Joshua, choose of our men to go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand up on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Okay, hold on. We, we, we don't hide this yet. There's a difference. There's a difference. The first one, God is having to tell Moses who he was and what he had. This time... Moses has some familiarity with a proven instrument. He has some familiarity with a proven instrument. And, and I think this is one of the reasons why Christians fail when they find themselves in a spiritual battle. is because they don't have familiarity with the Bible actually working for them. They don't have familiarity with scripture that they've quoted and that they stood upon working for them. 
So he said, ah, I tried quoting a scripture that Pastor Mike said last weekend and it didn't do anything. I'm not a millionaire. I didn't win the lottery. Come on. A word from your pastor is much different than a word from God. I want to tell you, this is how faith grows within a believer. Faith grows in a believer with previous wins, with victories, with overcoming battles. And as you have those small victories and those small battles, you don't actually get more faith, but the faith that you do have is empowered, right? It's way different believing God for $10 than $10 million. Way different. Way different, all right? In Exodus 17, Moses has already used the normal staff that God had entrusted him with. Now, this is not just a normal staff. God said, use the staff. Now Moses has the staff of God in his hand, right? The parting of the Red Sea transformed a normal stick, a normal staff, now into an instrument of God. The staff of God is in my hand. So in verse 4, God tells Moses, God told Moses, God told Moses, but here Moses doesn't hear a word from God. God didn't say to him, Moses, go and stand upon the hill and raise the staff. That didn't happen. Moses now has the authority to make decisions as a leader of God. Can I encourage you today? Some of us haven't stepped into our authority. We're still waiting for God to tell us all the little things instead of us stepping out in confidence that he's already told us everything. God didn't say, Moses, go step out and you'll win the battle. Moses determined, I know what this staff is. I know who my God is. I know that we have not yet got to the promised land and we must go through this land to get there. So I will hold the staff of God and we will win the battle. He now has trust and confidence in what God entrusted him with. Do you have trust and confidence in that which God has trusted you with? Mm. You do not need to wait for God's permission to use the gift that he has given you. Ooh, I know, I know. I know, but God, just show me a sign in the clouds and then I'll do something. Just reach me in a carnal way and then I'll do something spiritual. God says, I've given you tools. Why are you sitting on them? I've given you a voice. Why aren't you singing? I've given you writing tools. How come you're not writing? I've given you mechanical skills. Why aren't you doing mechanical? I've given you care skills. Why aren't you caring? I've already given you the tools, but you're sleeping. You're sleeping on your promised land. You're sleeping on it. You've given up on it. You're lazy on it. I've already given you all the tools. You don't need my permission to use what I've entrusted you with. Think about what Jesus said to his disciples. Why did you not tell the wind and the waves to stop? I've given you that authority. I've given you that permission. We didn't know we could. He said, I've given you all authority. I've given you all authority. Why aren't you using? That's really the synopsis of that story. Why aren't you using that which God entrusted to your care? I'm not saying to start screaming in tongues at every moment and everywhere that you're at. But God, if God has entrusted you to be an encourager, encourage people. If God has entrusted you to be a musician, use your musical talents to advance the kingdom of God. God has entrusted every single one of us with some sort of ability that is to propel the kingdom of God into the millennium. I just wonder how many churches and how many Christians are slowing down the process. This is not to shame. This is just to ask those questions. 
am I slowing down the advancement of God because I want to stay in the desert of sin? All right, let's get back to our story. So there's this battle going on, and Moses speaks to Joshua and tells him that I'm going to stand on top of the mountain. Here we go, Exodus 17, 10 through 12. So Joshua fought the Amalekites. And I just, that's just really, that's just interesting, right? Moses is the leader. He's like, Moses, uh, Joshua, you go put your life on the line. I'm going to stand on the hill and hold my staff. <laughs> anyway, Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the mountain. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, dang, it's so easy to grow weary in well-doing. It's so easy to be overcome by the pain of doing what's right. It's so easy easy to be overcome and get weary fighting your inner demons and the things that are trying to throw you off track. It's so easy to grow weary in following God's command. It is. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. Okay? The stone is the most important part, but we could, we could probably do a type and shadow that he sat on the cornerstone and he sat on the, you know, whatever. Sat on the stone that he hit, that water came out of. We could, we could make all sorts of things out of that. The important part here was he wasn't alone. He wasn't alone. In the moment that he began to grow weary, the people that he surrounded him with went into action to protect him. <laughs> what does your community look like? What does your inner circle look like? Which one of your friends has access to your stories, your struggles, and your secrets? Who's someone that can call your bluff when you're BSing? Who's someone there that says, man, dude, what's going on? You look like you're not good today and can hold your hands up. And if they're growing weary and they can't hold your hands up, they at least prop you up. Aaron and her held his hands hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. Can I, can I beg you, like, don't do life alone. Don't go through a dark moment alone. Don't battle your desert of sin alone. And I know it's embarrassing, and I know that we don't want to be discovered, and we don't want to be found out. I, I mean, I know all that. But when you can bring someone into your battle who's not going to embarrass you, who's not going to tell your business, who's not going to be ashamed of you and they're not impressed of you, there's some great things that you can do. The Bible says that a three-stranded cord is not easily broken. When you surround yourself with community and around people that can hold you up, Moses is supported by a stone, yet his arms are held up by those who are around him. He's seated on a stone. He's seated on the rock, right? He's held up. His main support is the rock, but his hands are held by community. The lesson I want us to pull out here today is although Moses is supported by the rock, Christ, he still needs community to support him in moments of weakness. When I took over this church seven years ago, I didn't have the same network connections that my dad had. My dad had built his friends and his, the guys that were his spiritual brothers and they would preach at each other's church and, and, and the way things were structured back then, like the second in charge didn't really have those same connections and so I took over and I was just kinda like, well, what's my network, who are my people? And I joined every network. I'm not gonna drop names, but I joined every network and I got myself in every single room. And it was just crazy. I would go into different rooms and different networks and different conferences and I'm like, these are not my people. And I walk into them, these are not my people. 
If I walk into a room and every pastor's white, these are not my people. They're not my people. I feel uncomfortable around just white people, right? I do. I'm like, this is, this is not heaven. This is not the diversity of the culture of heaven. This is not what it's going to look like. And about a year and a half ago, I got invited to go to a, a pastor's retreat. And I didn't know anybody. I was pretty reluctant to go. And by the end of that week, man, I found three friends. Three friends. We text almost every day. Not just about pastor stuff, but about personal stuff. And we throw in there, we're having a bad day. And what I love about it is it's not just a text group, but like you're going through a bad day. One of those guys is going to call you. And be like, all right, do you need a shoulder or do you need a pow like, do you need a, a beaten or do you just need to cry for a minute? And I'm not saying this to brag about anything, but I'm just telling you, like, I worked really hard to find community. I worked really, because I knew that I was growing weary after just a few years of running the church. I needed to find friends that could hold my hands up or others that needed me, because I like to serve, to hold their hands up. It's important to have community. I just want to throw this out there because we sing songs like, you are all I need, Jesus. Jesus, you, you're all I want. You're all I ever needed. That, that's kind of a lie. Like, you need oxygen to breathe. You need to go to the bathroom. You need to drink water. You need to eat food. Right? So he's not all you need, and I get it. I understand the concept of it. But when God created Adam, he said everything was good except that it is not good that man be alone. God knows that you need more than him. He is your beginning and end. He is your source of all things. But God knows you need community. God knows that we need humanity to come along each other to support our mission. Let's, let's close this out and see what happens. In Exodus 17, verse 13, so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. This is gonna be affirmed. I, I, want, I want the guy who just won the battle to know what I'm about to say. Because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. See, Joshua, you did your part. You won this battle. And because you were faithful to do what I called you to do, I will now do my part and do what you cannot do. See, sometimes when we're in the midst of a battle, we're in the midst of a warfare, it's so easy for us to get hung up on our experience, our feelings, our pain, that we're not aware of the workings of God behind the scenes of things that we had no idea about. God might be working a bigger miracle in your life than you're even aware of. What I love about this story is that the author of this story is Moses, as we've established. And although he was holding a staff and clearly that resulted in a victory, Moses actually gives credit to Joshua and so does God. leaders, people work for you, be careful to give credit to those who are making you a great leader. Don't be so self-absorbed self that you take credit for every victory that your team helped you get. Give props, encourage your friends. When someone was there for you in a tough time, let them know about it. Encourage those around us. As long as we win, it doesn't matter who gets credit. See, we can do anything. We can overcome anything if it doesn't matter who gets the credit. The moment we need to get credit for every single individual decision, we don't win. You did. Exodus 17, verse 15, Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, and the Lord 
will be a war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. We still know him as the Lord is our banner because of this battle. You know what I love too is that this is completely off notes, so we're going a different direction. We get hung up on names in the Bible, yet God gave permission to great men of the word to create names for him. Jehovah Jireh, that really wasn't his name, but it was created because of what he did. Jehovah Sitkanu, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, right? This one, the Lord is my banner. Today, I will call you the Lord is my banner because you oversaw and you overthrew and you protected me and, and brought me through this great battle. I just wonder if you're in a place where God has brought you through a great victory that you could have a nickname for God. You know, only friends have nicknames. Someone comes in and tries to call you a nickname from your inner circle, you're like, who are you? You don't know me like that. I had this one dude walk in, yo, Mikey, what's up? Who's Mikey? <laughs> Never has that ever been a nickname for me. I ain't nobody's Mikey. You call me P Mike, call me Rev, call me Church, whatever. Mikey ain't in there, especially from you, right? But friends have those nicknames. The psalmist. David told us this. He said he would share with his friends, he would share the secrets of his covenant. That God would share the secrets of his covenant with his friends. See, Moses was a friend of God. He talked to God. He had a relationship with God. And because of that relationship, he could take a devastating situation, a devastating battle, something that was coming against them, that God showed up and brought the victory and he says, God, I have a name for you today. I got a name that would benchmark this moment. The Lord is my banner. I'm trying to move on here so I can close this out. Here's some ideas that I wanna take you through today is that God doesn't want us settling for the desert of sin. He wants us to take us to a place of rest. Let's, let's jump forward to the disciples in a boat and there's a storm and they're all scared and the boat is like breaking apart. What was Jesus doing? Sleeping, sleeping. And guess what? All the disciples should have been too because they were never in danger. They were never in danger because the God of rest was in the boat resting with them. That boat could not have sunk with Jesus in it. They didn't, have, they didn't even have to use faith to calm the storm. They could have just fell asleep in his rest, knowing that the God who has power over the storm is with me. What shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? The Amalekites came to attack rest. And I'm telling you, the enemy wants to attack your rest. There's this word today that's such a buzzword, everybody's so tired. 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 I'm tired. Tired is such an ugly word, man. Where's the rest? Where's the joy? God's promise, his word has promised it. So maybe a spiritual battle is to find your place of rest. And I'm not saying your final place of rest. I'm not, I'm not talking about dying. I'm talking about rest while awake. Rest while being busy. Rest while being in battle. Right? He is our sword and our shield. Right? He's our shield. Do you know what we're supposed to do behind the shield? Rest. I mean, I was raised in a church where we love spiritual warfare. We get together on Tuesday nights and pray in tongues and scream at hell and bind this and loose this and scream at the devil. I rebuke you, devil. 
Ah, we were getting so angry, got ourselves all worked up. But then the New Testament says that we're supposed to rest, that the battle is the Lord's. The greatest spiritual maneuver that you can have in the middle of a battle is rest. All right, chew on that. Just chew on that. Second thing I want you to know is just stop waiting on God. You know what? You know what's got us all messed up about the, the, the idea of waiting on God? A dumb worship song. I'm waiting on you, waiting on. And God's like, Well, I'm waiting on you. And you're like, But I'm waiting on you. He's like, I'm waiting on you. But I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. Some of your greatest fights. What do you want for dinner? I don't know. What do you want for dinner? I don't know. God says, I've given you all things that pertain to life and godliness, I've given you authority. Use it. But I'm waiting on you, God. Stop waiting on God. If you're going to wait on God, it's not sitting in your house doing nothing. It's like a waiter waiting on God. How may I serve you? What would you like me to do? Here's what I have for you, God. Moses said, who said? Moses said, Go fight the battle, I'm gonna stand on the mountain with the staff. He made a leadership decision by the authority given to him by God. It's time that we start making some spiritual decisions that are moving our lives forward. The last thing I wanna leave you with is this, leave a legacy. Leave a legacy. Do your kids know Jesus? Do your families know Jesus? Moses brought along with him Joshua. So I want you to see what I see I want you to know what I know. I want you to hear what I hear. I want you right here with me. I don't want to leave you out of the the mix. Who are you sharing your talents with? Who are you sharing your treasure with? Who are you sharing your dreams with that will leave a legacy of what God has placed inside of you? Please don't let that book that needs to be written die inside of you. Don't leave that song that needs to be sung die inside of you. Don't let that really good family recipe die because that would just be a shame. Leave a legacy. Leave a spiritual legacy. Exodus 17, 14, then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. Write this down. Could you imagine if the authors of the Bible didn't write anything down? Well, you know, I used to keep a journal, but I don't journal anymore. We, we would not have scripture. If they didn't think it necessary to write down all the great things of God in their life, it's easy to forget what God has done if you don't write it down. I know a lot of us don't use paper Bibles anymore, but on the back page, of my Bible, it has like white pages. I will write down things that God spoke to me. I write down that things that I prayed for and when they came, came about in my life. I can go back to that page in my Bible and I can see the faithfulness of God to come through in my life over and over and over again. And so when I'm in a battle to try to step into rest and I feel like, man, God, you're not doing anything. I can look back that he has done a lot already. And if he has done a lot already, he will do a lot more to come. Be faithful to write about his faithfulness. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never even stepped into this place, I mean, you you still see yourself in bondage and you're stuck in Egypt. Today's the day to step to rest. And this is the great thing I love about God is that We don't have to go through the same exact journey that that the Israelites went through. We don't have to go out of Egypt, over the Red Sea, through the desert of sin, and then get to our rest. When you make a decision for Jesus Christ in your life, he can just take you and put you into rest. That doesn't mean that that there's not work that still has to be done on your soul. But you can be at rest even as God does a work on your soul. You can be at rest even though God's bringing you through recovery. You can be at rest 
even though God is bringing you through some of the most traumatic situations. Maybe you're, you're seeing a therapist, maybe you're seeing a counselor and, and you're working through some things in your past. You can still find rest even though your soul can be somewhat of a mess. We sing a song here that it is well with my soul and there was a season of my life I'd be sitting in the back and I'm like, just shut up with this song. Because in that season of my life, it wasn't well with my soul. There was anger. There was resentment. There was feelings of abandonment. Man, doggone do I deal with that. And then this song begins saying, it is well, it is well with my soul. And I'm like, my soul's a wreck. But my spirit was at rest. The Bible says this, a strong spirit will sustain you bodily, but a wounded spirit who could bear. See, when we get the spirit man right, all the other things can fall into alignment. But when the spirit's off, when the spirit's not right, when the spirit's deaf to God, nothing else is going to be right in your life. You're never going to get better trying to recover without a healthy spirit. And the only way to get a healthy spirit is let God do his work and bring dead things to life. If you're watching online or you're in the room and you never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, stepping from death to life, we'd like to offer that to you today. And we do that by praying something called the salvation prayer. It's just a declaration of faith. It's putting our faith in action. The Bible says that it's with the heart that man believes, but it's the mouth that confession is made unto salvation, unto righteousness. And so today we want to do that as a family. And that prayer goes like this, if you repeat with me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark. And if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm going to ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.